So now there are actually several different address spaces in OpenCL, and it's quite important what the address space is and which address space you're using. So kernel pointer arguments must use global, local, or constant. They cannot use private uh, pointers because that private pointer goes to every work item. And as you know, private memory is dedicated to a single work item. So it doesn't make sense to pass in a private address as an, ad as an argument to a kernel. So if you look, the second uh, example here under uh, the first bullet point where we say uh, kernel void sum private int star, that's illegal because you cannot pass a private pointer into a kernel. So one kind of gotcha that you're gonna run into here is that the default address space for arguments and local variables is private. <laughs> so whenever you pass in an argument and you don't specify something, it'll default to private. So this is a common mistake that everyone makes and that they forget to specify the specific memory space that they want for an argument, that argument defaults to private and then bad things happen just because that is not allowed. <clears throat> Note that image 2D and image 3D are always in global address space. So you also need to specify with the image types, are they read only or write only? So in that kernel you know, are you reading it or are you writing it? Because you can't do both at the same time with the image types. Program uh, global variables must be in the constant address space. So let's say you have a global variable that's being used by multiple kernels. That constant must be a global. So you cannot have a global value that is not constant. Also, casting between different address spaces is the undefined. So if I have a pointer into global memory, I cannot directly cast it into private memory because those are different memory spaces and actually might be stored in physically different memories. And so we're not allowed to actually do that casting operation because it might not be possible. If you wanna move data from global memory into private or global memory into local, you have to explicitly copy it. So you cannot cast those pointers from one memory space to another. So let's talk about some of the conversion routines. So scalar and pointer conversions follow C99 rules. There are no implicit conversions for vector types though. So let's say we have int4 vec that we want to implicitly cast to a float4 vector. That is illegal and not allowed because that is an implicit conversion. There are no casts for vector types. So there are different semantics for vectors. So you can't say float4 uh, from an int4. That's illegal cast as well. And the reason is, is that when you're doing a cast of a float4 to an int4 and vice versa, there are certain operations that you might want defined that will determine how that mathematical casting is actually done. So casts have other problems. Let's say that we have um, x plus 0.5 and then we want to cast it to an int. So we have float x plus 0 0.5 and then we want to cast it to an int. So the problem is, is that if you're at very, very, very small values um, of x at the very close to the uh, running out of precision, basically you could end up rounding up instead of down when you're supposed to. So uh, what's better is to actually have explicit functions that will tell you what kind of rounding is gonna be done and let the users explicitly specify what they want to happen uh, when certain operations are done. So, uh, and the nice thing is that basically every machine nowadays has hardware to do this, so this is not gonna be very painful uh, uh, for you to do, and it's not gonna cost very much execution time. So uh, it's, very, it's much better to be explicit and say what behavior you want instead of just relying on uh, what the machine's doing without knowing explicitly what you're asking for. So let's give a quick example here. So let's say we wanna do an explicit conversion uh, from one type to another. So you, it uses this uh, basic format where we have convert underscore destination type, and then we tell it the saturation mode and the rounding mode. So this works for scalar types and vector types. And the nice thing is that there's no ambiguity with, with this. So let's say we have a, a uchar4 and we wanna convert it to a float4 or vice versa. So basically we have this float4 and depending on what saturation type, when we convert it to the uchar4 that named c4, we'll know explicitly what's going on. So one example is that we can say saturate to zero so that when the value is negative, it'll just stop at zero and won't go negative. Another op uh, possibility is that round down to the nearest even. Another one is uh, round to nearest value, and we can also saturate to 255. So in this case, even though the value stored in the floating point value is much larger uh, than could be stored in a char, we know that it'll just saturate at 255 instead of wrapping around, because that behavior uh, would not be something you want because it could give you undefined results. So another type is we can reinterpret data as one, from one type to another type, and this is used by the as underscore type so this lets you reinterpret the bits from one type to another type. 
Uh, the types must be of a certain of the same size. But the nice thing is that this way you can take uh, a, a bit pattern that's stored in an integer and actually uses a floating point value and vice versa. So this is useful when you're doing uh, uh, certain operations where you, you need to use the same bit pattern, but you need to use it uh, for different types of data. So there are all sorts of ways of, of going between uh, the different data types using this basically as underscore type, where it'll use convert one type to another type directly without any conversions. Again, this is a very verbose set of, of commands that you can call, and I highly recommend going to the, the spec to see any further information about it. Let's talk about some of the built-in math functions. So IEEE 754 compatible rounding behavior is uh, the standard for single precision floating point in OpenCLC. IEEE 754 compliant behavior is for double precision floating point behavior. Again, your runtime can do something more advanced than that, but that's something you have to check uh, with your runtime using different kind of queries. So the, the reason that this is done is it defines a maximum error of math functions as ULP values. So um, it allows us to handle ambiguous C99 library edge cases. So there are different flavors of all the math functions. So let's say we want to do the log function. So there's a full precision, which has much less than three ULPs, or better than three ULPs. There's a half precision, which is faster, uh, and you have a minimum of 11 bits of accuracy, but again, you're giving accuracy for the possibility of going faster. And then finally, you can do a native function. So you could call the function log, you could call half log, or you could call native log. The reason we have this native function is a lot of times hardware has special purpose um, hardware built to do these certain operations uh, very fast. But in a GPU, for example, it's usually good enough for graphics. And so that might not be what you want for a scientific computation. So again, it's up to uh, the application to decide what is more important, uh, accuracy or performance, or maybe even a mixture of both is what you need. Let's look at some of the built-in workgroup functions. So there's synchronization. So there are barriers which bear, uh, synchronize between the execution of elements in a workgroup, and there are mem fences that tell you how to synchronize memory. There's a standard mem fence, but then you can also say, I want to do a barrier on reads, or I want to do a barrier on writes to give the uh, hardware and the runtime some hints as to what you're doing and what you care about so that it can do further optimizations. So an example is, let's say we're doing some operation where we do a read. So we'll say, get our global I if our global ID is less than something, we're going to do this barrier. This is actually illegal because not all work items are going to encounter this barrier. And this is actually uh, quite bad because what will happen is uh, you're, you're basically setting up a barrier but then not having everyone hit the barrier. So this is something you, you, you don't actually want to do. You want to make sure that all work items in the work group execute that same function. Okay, let's talk about some built-in functions. So there are integer functions, so the sort of all the standard math integer functions that you would uh, expect are there. There are image functions, as we talked about earlier, which are read image, write image, and the get image. And there are also common geometric and relational functions uh, for um, vector data and loading and store data. So you can have v load half, v store half. So again, uh, there are quite a verbose set of these functions, and I highly recommend you go to the spec to, to read about them. Finally, let's talk about some of the extensions. So atomic functions, for example, are one of the optional extensions to OpenCL. And these uh, functions uh, allow us to do atomic operations to global and local memory. Uh, there are 32-bit and 64-bit integers only. And you can do things such as add, subtract, exchange. Um, again, for all the atomic operations and a description of them, uh, please refer to the spec. You can also, one of the extensions is selecting rounding mode for um, the different inst instructions at compile time. So um, again, there's lots of optional extensions that I highly recommend going to uh, the application, or going to the spec and reading how these optional um, extensions are used and how the rounding modes are used um, because it's quite verbose and the spec is, is very good re uh, resource for this. And you know, how you actually check these extensions is you use the CL get device info with CL device extensions. So this will tell you uh, about the extensions that are supported by your runtime. And that'll depend, uh, you know, one CPU versus one GPU versus another GPU might have different uh, support for different extensions. So this is something you want to do at runtime if it's something you absolutely need to, to use. I'm Justin Hensley, a senior member of technical staff in AMD's office of the CTO. I really appreciate you watching all these videos and thank you for your time.